our speaker tonight. Um, if you're in 530, you already got to hear him speak a few weeks ago when he spoke to us about transportation. But tonight, Dr. Flom is gonna be talking about children and disasters. He is an emergency EMS physician and a disaster preparedness and response consultant. He is at Hershey Med, so he's very familiar with Penn State and um, a lot of the stuff that we talk about in our program. He was a special ops paramedic, served in war-torn parts of the world, and later certified as a flight paramedic, and uh, served in that capacity as a combat search and rescue, in a combat search and rescue unit. He went to med school in New York, and he did an emergency medicine residency in Pennsylvania. He's an attending physician at um, Hershey Medical Center, Department of Emergency Medicine, and he's completing a fellowship year with Lifeline Critical Care Transport and EMS, where he, he is the assistant medical director. He has a very interesting background, and it um, well, we got to hear him talk a few weeks ago to our class. We got to hear some of that, so I hope we um, can hear that as you're speaking tonight. Um, he worked with the New York City uh, DOHMH Pediatric Disaster Coalition for seven years. So he's got a lot of experience with children and disasters, and I look forward to hearing your presentation tonight. So I will turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the really uh, kind introduction. Uh, so yeah, my name is uh, Ivy Flam. I'm an ER doctor here at Hershey, and I also do uh, EMS stuff. And I'm really interested in uh, pre-hospital and disaster medicine. Uh, which uh, is why I'm here today. So I'm here to talk about uh, children in disaster and hopefully uh, convey the message that the danger is real. I don't have any conflicts of interest. And here are some uh, thank yous and references. So there are a lot of types of disasters and uh, you're probably all familiar with them, so I'm not gonna go into them in detail. There's also a lot of children everywhere. Uh, it's about 25% of the population as children. They're the largest vulnerable population by far. Uh, and of that, there's also disabled children, children that are dependent on technology. And 30% of children live at or near the poverty line, uh, which puts them uh, at especially, uh, at an especially vulnerable place. Most children need uh, their environment and response uh, provided to them by adults they can't provide for themselves. And that's why they're a very unique population and uh, very susceptible to disasters. Children are also obviously our future and uh, we care a lot about children. And that's why it's very important that we uh, plan accordingly to take care of our future. So children are victims of disasters all the time. They depend on, they depend on adults for needs. Uh, they are unfortunately intentionally targeted many times, and they're more, more susceptible to disease and environmental uh, extremes. This is just a partial list of uh, times children were targeted in uh, terrorist bombings in red, and there are many more. Uh, the list is just too long to list. Children are, in general, targeted as primary targets. Uh, and this is just the list going back to the 1800s and uh, until, until this year, until last year. So it happens all the time. Children are targeted as primary targets. That means whoever's going out to target them intentionally goes out uh, with a plan to hurt children uh, all the time. And we need to be aware of that and uh, plan accordingly. Now, individual children with special health care needs can also be part of an MCI, a mass casualty incident, uh, and uh, they'll also need special response. For example, the kid in the wheelchair is not going to need the same care as a kid that can jump off the school bus and uh, run and hide. Uh, and also children that have braces and can't really walk by themselves are going to need additional care. Kids with special needs have more difficult airways to manage. They uh, need their equipment. And when we talk about technology, we're talking about vents, uh, kids that have trachs and they're on vents. We're talking about diabetic monitors, backup generators, supplies, nebulizers. We're talking about asthma medication, EpiPens, insulin that needs to be refrigerated. We're talking about transport issues, 
that uh, they need to get places uh, with special transport. They need to be even suctioned if they have a trach during the transport. And they need specialized medical support like nursing or respiratory therapists. Children have had uh, a lot of uh, vulnerabilities, and this is just a small list. For example, in Katrina, uh, 2,000 people were killed, 2 million were evacuated, and 5,000 children were separated from their families. And think about the huge impact that has on a child when they're in a disaster, they're separated from their uh, parents or families for a long period of time. In the World Trade Center, around 3,000 people were killed, but how many of them were parents and how did that impact children? And uh, the list goes on. We can talk about the H1N1 where ch children were especially vulnerable. Uh, they were primary victims. And uh, let's talk, we don't have to look far back. We can even look at the uh, COVID-19. And uh, if you look at certain countries, for example, Japan, one of the first things they did when uh, they got uh, an outbreak was to close down the schools. And how does closing schools impact children in all these different countries? And maybe coming here too. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, there was a serious outbreak here. Uh, the, as is predicted or worse, uh, schools might shut down here or daycares and uh, how will that affect children? For a normal person, it's hard to think about going and intentionally targeting a child, but uh, there are people out there whose uh, job it is to uh, cause terror and uh, when they set out to attack children, they especially are looking for that impact, that shock and awe uh, of they were capable of hurting children, so they're probably capable of doing anything. So children are actually specifically uh, targeted and they're soft tar targets, they're easy to target. They have pretty root, they have, they, they're, they're pretty uh, congregated during daytime. They have regular routines, they're in daycare, in school, in camp. They go to school in buses that stop at the same places every day. And uh, school planning is variable depending on where you are and probably not adequate. Uh, many schools don't have very good uh, protection or disaster plans. And uh, notification and reunification plans are rare. And of course, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, mass gatherings where children uh, are present and children can be targeted. Public transport can be a place where children are, uh, are targeted. This is specifically a bus that I personally uh, was uh, present at. And you can see there are a lot of strollers outside because this bus was full of children that were targeted. This is why the bus like this uh, looks inside uh, after a suicide attack. Children have different physiologic response, meaning they lose their volume, the volume of their blood faster, they become colder faster, and they have airway and IV access issues. They also have psychosocial response issues. They're very dependent on their age and level of, dependent, uh, of development on how they understand what's going on around them. Uh, they're very uh, dependent on their parents or caretakers. Uh, it reflects in play and kids can uh, go into regression if they experience uh, extreme conditions and disasters. So size definitely matters. So children need special considerations. They're at greater risk for injury. They have different physical uh, dimensions. They are different than adults in developmental uh, aspects. And they're different than adults in psychosocial aspects and in their understanding of what's going on around them. They have different anatomy. And I'm not going to go into all the medical details. But uh, it's much harder to treat children and more complicated. They have more pliable skeletons. So they're more susceptible to internal injuries to cardiac and lung injuries, even without showing any fractures because their, skeletals, their skeleton is so uh, pliable. Their head is much larger compared to uh, adults in proportion to the rest of their body. So they're more susceptible to uh, head injuries and uh, spinal injuries and uh, blood loss. They have a much higher 
body surface area compared to their weight mass. So they're more susceptible to uh, poisons or toxins that can permeate through their skin and, get, and poison them. They have very variable vital signs compared to based on their age. So it's very hard to interpret uh, their vital signs. And you have to be an expert in pediatric emergency medicine sometimes to figure out if a kid is having a fast heart rate or is just uh, a little uh, upset because uh, they're in the hospital. And the list goes on. Children have developmental issues when they are exposed to disasters. They're not able to recognize danger to begin with, so they can't stay away from it or run away from it. They can't provide reliable information about their medical history, about their families, about their school. Some kids can't even tell you uh, where they live if they're at a certain age. They may have stress reactions that will be difficult to diagnose and treat but will come up later on in their life and have a significant impact on them. And it's important to address those early. So in psychological issues, we, taught, we spoke about parental dependence. Uh, their parents' mental health a lot of times reflects on the children. Uh, and uh, it's important to uh, think about PTSD, anxiety, and acute stress in these type of circumstances and not wait until later on and address them to prevent long-term damage from children. This child is looking at this guy and he doesn't understand why the guy is wearing a space suit and holding a shiny metal thing next to his head. This is a study that was uh, published about children's response to disasters. It was at a town where children were uh, continuously exposed to uh, rocket fire. And uh, as you can see, a lot of them reported a lot of very concerning uh, side effects from uh, their everyday living uh, from uh, being exposed to this. So to summarize, their injuries are different. Uh, children's injuries in uh, terrorist attacks or bombings or disasters are different than the routine trauma uh, specialists will see on an everyday basis. And it's important to recognize those and know how to prepare for them. So we're talking about, for example, blast injuries, shrapnel, chemical injuries, they're gonna be different than uh, what a pediatric surgeon or pediatric emergency medicine physician is uh, seeing in an everyday. The injuries will depend on developmental age and related anatomy. And uh, it's important to take into account that the stress response is different. When we speak about children, it's really even hard to categorize what a child is, because it really depends. Most common victims of uh, disasters are actually uh, teenagers in the uh, pediatric population, and then young adults. But sometimes children are primarily targeted and they're younger. And then what do we consider pediatric age group? Is it zero to 12? Because at 13, 14, some kids are you know, the same size as an adult. Or is it zero to 18, uh, which is kind of like a lot of times what the legal uh, definition is? Or is it zero to 21, where some pediatric clinics will say, we're gonna see someone and consider them a pediatric patient until they're 21, and they, uh, uh, then they, only then they graduate to an adult clinic. So uh, the definitions are murky. When we look at the type of injuries based on research that was done, children suffer more severe injuries. They have longer and more complicated ED stays, ICU stays. They have more injuries with shrapnel, more bl blast lung, more ear injuries, more abdominal injuries, head, more amputation, and more vascular injuries. It's important to recognize that blast and shrapnel injuries, which is not an everyday type of injury for most medical staff in the US, is something that could happen to children and will have unique characteristics that are important to uh, recognize. You may need to use a lot more CT scans and x-rays that will cause a bottleneck uh, when you're treating children. 
And this uh, information is based on a study that was done in Israel. They uh, categorized uh, pediatric injuries and they looked, most of them were uh, blast injuries, but some of them were also gunshot wounds. And they kind of gave us this uh, epidemiologic breakdown of what type of injuries to expect. And this is probably the, more, the, the largest number of cohort of uh, uh, children that were studied in disasters and uh, give us an idea of what we can look at. So you can see yellow is children, black is adult. And you can see pretty much in everything except for spinal cord injuries uh, and uh, chest injuries that children have more of those type of injuries. They utilize more ICU. They need more CT scans in the ED and around the same number of surgeries compared to adults. But look at this, this is an interesting graph. I know there's a lot of colors here, but the takeaway is very simple. When you look at the orange and red, which represent multi-injury, multi-organ injury, children had more multiple organ injuries compared to adults. So they're more likely to have multiple injuries get hurt in uh, a disaster. And this is an example of shrapnel. You can have ball bearings, metal pieces, uh, nails sometimes, metal pallets. So to summarize, children obviously are younger, arrive in mass, more severely injured. They have a heavier, they're heavier consumers of resources. They have more severe injuries, more ICU admissions. They need more procedures. And walking wounded are a significant issue that we will speak about moving forward too. What do you do with the children that arrive without their parent and who babysits them, who watches them? Because you can't just take a five-year-old, put them on the bed in an emergency department and tell them stay here. So therefore, the pediatric plan and response to disaster, disasters should be tailored to the special needs of children. And just like we have gas masks for adults and for children, and we have pediatric rooms, we should also have specific plans for disasters involving children because how we respond matters. So hopefully in the first half of the talk that I covered, uh, you recognize that the danger is real. This is something that's happening all the time, all around the world, including in the US, and that children have specific dangers uh, in disasters that adults don't have, that children are especially vulnerable in disasters. Realize that unfortunately, sometimes children are targeted specifically. And then I would like you to think for yourself about your community and identify gaps in preparedness for disasters involving children. So what should you do? Where do you start? So the first few things you can do if you want to impact disaster preparedness for children in your community is create a coalition. And the reason is this is not a one person show. You're gonna need a lot of stakeholders involved. You're gonna look at emergency preparedness, critical care, surgery, emergency medicine, Department of Health, emergency management offices, fire departments, EMS, local government, there are gonna be a lot of stakeholders that will all have to buy in and agree to participate in order to create a plan for children. Major areas you can focus on to start with are pediatric disaster field triage. You can talk about uh, how you're gonna do primary and secondary survey and transportation. How the hospitals, the local hospitals are gonna to respond to children in disasters. Talk about, you, you need to speak about and have a serious conversation about what capabilities each hospital has. And hospitals that don't have a pediatric, a children's hospital, may have very limited capabilities to deal with children. But if there is a disaster involving children, right in close proximity to a hospital like that, they are still going to get a lot of these children involved. And they could stand at the door and say, well, we're sorry. Uh, we're, we're, not, we're an adult hospital. We're not a children's hospital. The children are still going to arrive. And uh, that's why it's very important to recognize what capabilities each hospital has. If you're in a hospital that's not a pediatric hospital, still recognize that you may be 
called to deal with pediatric casualties and you may not be able to just transfer them all to a different hospital. We need to look at pediatric critical care surge capacity and a lot of research shows that that's one of the biggest bottlenecks and in disasters involving children is critical care beds, PICU beds. And uh, consider training the local physicians and nurses in pediatric, uh, the fundamentals of pediatric critical care uh, response. It's a course that's put out by the Society for Critical Care Medicine, and it's intended for non-intensivists to uh, be able to start treating children, uh, providing pediatric critical care, the initial treatment, uh, specifically for disasters. I'd suggest you build on previously developed resources. There are a lot of resources out there. Many cities have created pretty comprehensive pediatric disaster plans. And it would be a pity to create everything and start developing everything from scratch. Uh, New York City has a, a major, they put millions of dollars into creating plans. Uh, LA has, San Francisco, San Diego, uh, and the list goes on. So if you wanna start planning, I would suggest you just pick up one of these websites from one of these towns and cities that's already done it and spent a lot of money. And they put, they, for the most part, they put everything online and uh, public access and use the information and use all the toolkits and use all the resources that have really or already been developed to create your own plan instead of rather than developing everything from scratch. This is an example of uh, mass casualty incident operations at uh, San Diego. When you look at planning for disasters involving children, you wanna look at the chain of events and you want to address each part of the chain. And we have triage, which is the field triage. It's how do we even treat children? Are we gonna treat children in triage the same as we treat adults? In a mixed event with adults and children, are we gonna give children any priority? Say, well, if an adult and a child are injured with the same uh, type of injuries, we're gonna take the child first. Uh, are we gonna give uh, the fact that children are children any specific consideration? That's all important stuff to discuss. The next thing is, where are we gonna take the children? So you need to know which hospitals have what capabilities and take the appropriate patient to the appropriate hospital. The hospital that has all the critical care units for children, the PICUs, the PICU beds, should not be necessarily filled with all the walking well, well children that have scratches. But then the hospital that has no PICUs but has a really large urgent, urgent uh, care attached to it across the street, probably shouldn't be getting all the critical children. So having a tiered response and knowing where you're sending the patients and making sure the hospital that's receiving them has the correct capabilities is key. And that needs to be planned ahead of time because during an event, it's practically impossible to create something like that. Then you wanna talk about transport. How do we even transport children? What if their parents are not with them? How do we transport children by themselves? Uh, do we have car seats to transport them in? How do we even safely buckle them up in an ambulance? So there's a lot of thought that needs to go into how we transport children. And then we need to think about secondary transport. Once the children arrive in a hospital and are stabilized, that hospital may not have the pedi pediatric capabilities. For example, a pediatric neurosurgeon or a pediatric surgeon, general surgeon for that matter. And the children may need to be stabilized initially and transferred by secondary transfer to a capable hospital that has those capabilities. And uh, it might sound easy, well, we'll just call an ambulance and have them take the kid to the receiving hospital, pediatric receiving hospital, but all the ambulances may already be at the event. So you have to plan ahead of time for secondary transport and how you're gonna do that. And then the most complicated and most time and resource intense planning part of uh, the whole deal is surge, increasing surge capacity in your hospital. So triage. What type of triage algorithm are you gonna use in the field for children? The, for example, there's uh, start uh, and jump start, which is a kind of very common triage uh, algorithm used, but there are many others. So it needs to be determined what triage algorithm you're gonna use for children. Do children get specific triage categories? And where do the children go? Then we talk about tiering. So we need to speak about 
we, we have to discuss, does the hospital have capabilities for mechanical ventilation, volume resuscitation, transfusions, multiple drips, advanced airway care, labs, and then maybe tier two hospitals will be able to give oxygen, IV fluids, and some uh, oral medications, scheduled medications. And those are different tiers for exa an example of tiering for pediatric disaster receiving hospitals and how we would differentiate between them. Transport. How will we transport the children? How will we have secondary transport to get the kids to where they need to go? And surge. When we talk about surge planning, we need to talk about staff, stuff, space, and systems, the four S's. And that needs to work. We need to discuss all these things in EMS, emergency department, radiology, pediatrics floor, PICU, child life if we have it, OR, PACU, and security. And each one of these uh, listed needs to have a surge plan that will discuss how we uh, increase the bed capacity to deal with all these kids coming in now, all uh, very sick possibly. To ED surge planning, specifically uh, the ED should have a surge plan that involves children, that discusses how we're gonna create a surge plan if a lot of children show up. And uh, adult emergency physicians uh, are usually trained in pediatrics to an extent, uh, but they should also be trained in fundamental of pediatric critical care support, this course that can help adult emergency physicians uh, provide pediatric critical care, the initial parts of a pediatric critical care treatment in a disaster. You have to think about who's gonna supervise all the children arriving alone. So there's gonna be children uh, brought in by ambulance and they're gonna be put on a bed traditionally, right or in the room or maybe in the hallway if there's a lot of uh, victims. And how do you make sure that that kid that just arrived and is probably hurt, just went through an extremely traumatic event, was separated from their family or caretakers, has no idea what's going on or why they're there. How do you make sure that kid stays on the bed and doesn't start wandering around or out of your emergency department? So you have to have people that will watch these children. And who will do that? And are they trained to watch the children? How will they keep the kids where they want them to keep them, where they want them to stay? And then you also have to think about family reunification. So a parent comes and they're looking for their child and they come to the emergency department. So suppose an adult comes to your emergency department and points at little Johnny and is like, that's my kid. Are you gonna let them just go and take little Johnny and walk out? How do you know that that's actually little Johnny's parent? Uh, if the kid is young enough, they'll smile at anyone that comes and smiles at them. So you have to have a family reunification plan and there needs to be a center, probably not in the emergency department, should probably be even off-site where you have pictures of children that you have in your emergency department online. And then anyone that's coming to claim a child should be have to identify the child, provide information and prove that it's actually their child. And there are a lot of different methods to do this uh, safely. Uh, to make sure we're not reuniting a child with someone uh, that's not their parent. We also at this point need to consider the psychological impact on children. And it's very easy to brush it off and say, hey, we're in the middle of a disaster now. People are dying. We don't have time to consider the psychological impact on children. We'll take care of that later. But there is actually pretty good evidence that that's something that should be taken into consideration right away because if it's not, there are significant imp implications for children long-term. And if it's addressed, the sooner it's addressed, the better the outcomes. So it should be part of the disaster planning, having and uh, addressing that aspect of the pediatric uh, patient's care too. This is an example of a surge capacity in an atrium of a hospital. So pediatric critical care surge planning you need to create pediatric critical care surge capacity recommendations. What are you gonna do? How many beds are you gonna add? What kind of capabilities are you gonna have? You need to recruit the hospitals with pediatric critical care capabilities to begin with, because those are the hospitals that are gonna increase and surge and increase the bed capacity. Make sure you have a fundamentals of critical care support, and I don't have any uh, 
interest in this course, uh, I have taken it myself as a uh, physician. Uh, it's a good course, the Fundamentals of Critical Care Support, and uh, it just helps non-intensivists uh, provide critical care uh, early on. You want to complete pediatric critical care search plans and uh, make sure you can add surge beds to the regularly available pediatric critical care beds. And I can tell you that there have been some studies done that show that there are not a lot of regularly, regularly available PICU beds uh, floating around. Most PICUs don't uh, live with uh, half their beds empty. Most PICUs are pretty full on an everyday basis, especially now in the winter with all the viral stuff going around and all the respiratory stuff going around, the PICUs are pretty full. So there may not be a lot of PICU beds just available on a regular day, like today, for example. And then you have to think about how many beds you're going to increase in search capacity. Are you going to add 20%? Are you going to double? Are you going to triple your capacity? And there is a consensus statement from, uh, that was published in uh, the journal CHEST, which is the main critical care or, uh, journal. And uh, they suggest that the immediate surge capacity should be 20% above the baseline of ICU. Uh, and that's for a conventional response. And then they go on to say that they recommend doubling up with local and regional resources. And they recommend tripling when it comes to a crisis response. And that then they acknowledge that that would take regional, national, and probably international resources. So 20% would probably be a good number to start with, and maybe doubling up would be good too. Uh, but unfortunately, most uh, PICUs have not even created plans for uh, adding a 20% increase. So uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And this was published in 2014. And I, uh, last time I looked, uh, there has not been a lot of work done since then. This is the fundamental uh, pediatric fundamental critical care support. And there's also an, an adult course. Uh, I've taken both and they're both excellent courses if there are any physicians uh, on the call. This is an example of what you need to look at when you create a hospital pediatric surge plan. So you need to look about notification. How are you gonna get your notifications? And the notification go to, should go to the ED, the PZD, and activate the Hospital Incident Command Center. Next thing you want to do is you want to em start emptying out your hospital. You want to discharge anyone you can from your PICU. Anyone that can get downgraded to the floor should go to the floor right away. And uh, you could use something that's called a rapid patient discharge to send people from the PICU or even from the floor home to the floor or a step down PICU. You want to create as many beds available at your baseline before you start doubling up as you can. You want to make sure you enlist additional staff and you may not call them in right away because you also need to maintain the surge long term probably, but you need to start thinking about uh, having a plan and how you're going to have your hours, uh, your shifts set up so you have good, uh, appropriate coverage and this uh, surge capacity. You're going to look about opening alternate sites for PICUs. You're going to need monitors, you're going to need power and sockets, you're going to need access to ventilators, because vent and ventilators use gases, so you're going to need uh, access to gas. And then you're going to need uh, code cards and, med and meds, and all those will be have to be available at your alternate site for PICU. And uh, it might be in a pediatric floor that already deals with sicker children, it might be uh, in a PACU, there's a lot of places you could do it with. And then you want to have a surge plan that can be sustained for 96 hours. You need to think about an isolation surge capacity. What if everyone comes in with the COVID-19 with respiratory failure? And uh, you need to think about access and equipment and supplies down the line. So this is an example taking looking into different aspects of creating a surge plan in your hospital. You can use to double up, you can use uh, transport, uh, luxurious uh, transport stretchers. You can use even these PVC kind of uh, stretchers that are sold for disaster uh, means. You may not be able, you may not use the fancy uh, ICU beds that you use on an everyday basis, and that's okay. 
because we're talking about a disaster and increasing it. And you may not have enough beds to increase even 20%, but definitely not 100% double up your number of bed ICU beds with your normal regular beds that you would use. And this is an example of doubling up in an ICU in a PICU room uh, with uh, all the equipment. Uh, and this picture got cut off, but the equipment that's on this side of the uh, on this side on the ICU bed is also on the other side. Additional consideration when uh, thinking about search plans, you should think about neonatal care. Think about maternal and expecting mothers who may also be involved in a disaster and need uh, specialized care. And uh, again, children with special needs. I can't stress enough about how it's important to plan for these children because they're very, they're probably the most vulnerable among children and need special consideration. And that's how you plan for every step of the way uh, in a disaster. Once you create a plan, you want to create, you want to start testing your plan and see if it works. So you could start with a discussion based exercise. You should include scenarios of pediatric critically ill patients. Ideally, I would recommend creating a, the, the drills and uh, testing your plan in a realistic scenario, meaning having adults and peds patients in your drill come in at the same time, because that's usually what's gonna happen in real life. Sometimes it's only gonna be children, a lot of times it's gonna be mixed. So it's important to make sure that when you're doing adult and pediatric surge, uh, you're not taking from one or the other. And if you are, you have to know how you're gonna uh, manage that. And then you wanna do full-scale exercises. And the advantage of full-scale exercises, is it suddenly lets you figure out all these different things that your plan had in place and sounded very plausible. But when you actually try and execute it, when you try and suddenly use those two stretchers to put them in the picky room, you suddenly realize that there's not enough space or you suddenly realize that you only have one outlet, one connection for oxygen. And, or you realize the tubing for your vent is not long enough to reach the second bed. All these details that are really important are things you're, you can discover in a functional exercise and you may miss in a discussion-based exercise when people can say, oh yeah, I put two patients in a room and we're good now, they're both on vents. You, will, you should also consider broader considerations. So again, children are not in a vacuum, so it should be within the context of also planning for an adult, for the an, ev events with adults. And then you start getting into very murky and difficult questions. For example, ventilator allocation. If we have a pandemic with uh, res a lot of people that have respiratory failure, we may run out of vents. And the reason is a lot of hospitals have a few extra vents in the hospital, but once you use them up, the next step for the hospital to do is they call a company and they rent additional vents. But in a large pandemic, when a lot of people are going into respiratory failure, guess what? Everyone's calling this company and it might be one company in your region and everyone's trying to rent additional vents. And this company may run out of vents pretty fast. Now there are national stockpiles of vents it's not easy to get to them and it may take a while until you see anything from there. So it's important to plan for ventilator allocation. And uh, you know, it's uh, considered sometime an ugly, uh, it's it, it considered uh, the uh, ugly term, but uh, deciding who gets a vent and who doesn't. And if you decide that ahead of time and you decide about rationing, if there's a limited supply and you decide ahead of time, what type of criteria you're gonna use for rationing of care, you're much less liable long-term uh, than if you start making it up as you go along when the disaster happens. So it protects physicians, it protects the staff, and it's a good thing to have that kind of thing prepared. And then a newer technology that we may also see uh, shortages in is ECMO allocation. ECMOs is uh, extracorporeal uh, membrane oxygenation it's basically an artificial heart and lung machine. And uh, they're very resource intense. They take a lot of people to operate and treat a person that's on ECMO. And uh, who gets the ECMO? How do children fit into the allocation of ECMO compared to adults? Uh, we, don't, we have very limited capa ECMO capabilities in the US in general. So how do we decide who will get those resources if uh, 
there is more uh, demand than uh, resources. So those are all considerations that are important to address ahead of time and hopefully not leave to uh, start thinking about when the disaster actually happens. Personal planning is also important. We spoke about planning in uh, a hospital setting, but you also want to plan personally and you want to make sure that the employees in the hospital have a plan. There have been studies that show that a significant percentage of hospital employees will not come to work if they think that there's a deadly pandemic going on at their hospital and that they could get it. Because people are worried about their families, will I come home to my family and give it to them? Additionally, if the schools are in daycares are closed, a lot of workers won't even be able to come to work because they're gonna to have to stay home with their children. So you can see easily, you can lose a lot of staff just for uh, if you have a problem with family planning. So that's why it's very important that you make sure your institution and yourself has a family plan in place. And each employee should have a family plan. They should know what they're gonna do in a disaster so you can keep operations as uh, normal as possible. There are various degrees of uh, preparedness. And you know there are people that will uh, dig a nuclear bunker in their backyard. And that's not what I'm advocating here. I'm advocating here for pretty much a bare minimum of stuff that will keep you going and allow you to work for a few days if a disaster strikes. And obviously there's a lot more you can do beyond this. So in terms of home preparation, you should have three days worth of food supplies. Uh, you know, if you can't get food uh, tomorrow, you shouldn't, you and your family should not go hungry. Uh, we, talk, we talk about batteries, flashlights, first aid kits, whistle. You should teach your children uh, what shelter in place means, where they're gonna hide if there's an earthquake or something like that if you're in a prone area and have uh, things that will help you uh, keep dust out of your house. Have some sanitation uh, equipment, uh, have some tools to shut off your utilities if you have a gas leak, uh, have a, ma a manual can opener because if you want to eat your cans and you don't have a can opener I can imagine that would be very frustrating. Local maps because the cell phones and computers may be out and uh, extra medication just a little bit extra so you know if you don't you can't go to the pharmacy tomorrow and get your uh, medication, if you're dependent on insulin, for example, stuff like that, it's always good to have a little bit extra. So home and family plan again, secure in bookcases so they don't fall if there's an earthquake, cupboards, closets, securing appliances, and uh, automatic gas shutoff valves can be very uh, useful. Have an emergency plan for the family so everyone knows where to go and what the plan is if a disaster strikes. And this is an example from uh, FEMA, from ready.gov, of uh, what a family plan could look like. People's information, date of birth, where they're going to go, and uh, what grade they're in, stuff like that. In terms of work preparedness, have a go bag that's good for 24 hours. Have some contacts and glasses if you use them. Have some comfortable, uh, an extra, extra, extra pair of comfortable shoes and uh, have this all ready to go in a go bag. Have your vehicle prepared if you think you're gonna go on a long drive or something like that when there's a disaster, have some extra like uh, first aid kits, flashlights, water, cat litter if there's uh, extreme weather, ice scraper, shovel, warm clothes, blankets if your car has to stop in the middle of the highway because you get stuck in a blizzard, uh, at least you'll stay warm if your gas runs out. Any questions? So to summarize, we spoke about children in disaster. Uh, we discussed that children are uh, very vulnerable in disasters. Unfortunately, they're sometimes targeted specifically. They're very different from adults and what they need in a disaster. And then uh, we discussed how to plan for a disaster involving children in terms of the entire chain of events and triage, where to take the children. We called it tiering the hospitals, what type of, what tier each hospital is, how we're gonna transport the children to the hospital, 
and which hospital we're going to transport them to. And then we talked about increasing surge capacity in the emergency department and all the other departments that are relevant. We talked about special considerations for children specifically, other than, you know, where they differ from adults. For example, they need babysitters to watch them. You need a family reunification center where parents can come and claim their adults, uh, their children and prove that it's actually their children. And uh, then we talked about secondary transport. Uh, we talked about uh, special considerations and we spoke about personal preparedness. You wanna make sure everyone in your organization has a disaster plan for themselves and for their family so you can continue operations as usual. Any questions? Thank you very much for that. That was, that was very, very interesting. A little terrifying at some parts thinking about it, but obviously this is very important information and really important things to, uh, to be considering. So um, if we have anybody who's got any questions, you can either um, use your mic and ask them or, oh, actually I, I see a raised hand. So JD, I'll let you go first. And then um, if anyone else has a question, raise your hand and um, we can either have you use your mic and you can talk or you can uh, type it in the group chat and I'll just read it out. But JD, I'll um, turn it over to you. You had uh, mentioned uh, in the very beginning about schools. Um, did you mean that existing schools need better disaster plans on what to do with their kids or that it should be planned to set up schools in an ongoing disaster? Uh, I, I was referring to schools, current existing schools, the schools all around us, uh, typically, uh, based on surveys that have been done, are not prepared for disasters. Uh, they have poor security. They have poor plans for uh, evacuation. They have poor plan. They have lack or very poor planning in terms of how they're going to get children to their parents. They don't usually have plans in terms of medical treatment for children in schools. So there's a, there's, they're lacking a lot of... Uh, planning for disasters. Thank you. Any more questions? I, this is Alex. Um, I don't have an exact question, but I just wanted to let you know that it's a really good overview. I'm actually a pediatric nurse, and one of the common misconceptions is that children are just little adults and that they can be treated the same, and that's not correct at all. So this was a really good uh, presentation pointing out some of those uh, key concepts. Thank you. We have a question in the chat from Dr. Langrish, and he is wondering what are some good sources of after action reports that are PEED specific? Well, a after action report is usually generated based on an exercise. So I'm not sure that I'm familiar with a specific after action report uh, that's PEED specific because it will depend very much on the institution that did the uh, exercise. Uh, I think I know I know that the uh, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene publish pretty much all of their uh, pediatric disaster preparedness stuff uh, online, and uh, I'm pretty sure that LA uh, LA County do the same. So they probably do have examples of after action reports. But in the end of the day, the specifics for the after action report are gonna be specific for the uh, exercise you conducted and uh, for your institution. Okay, I see another hand up. So um, Jenny, go ahead. Hi, um, so I'm a child life specialist um, that works uh, actually at Penn State Health as well. Um, I was just curious as to how psychosocial services are incorporated into the um, like mass casualty um, exercises and the actual events? So I, uh, that's an excellent question. And I would encourage, I, I think I even included in my slide that child, ch ch child life and child services should be uh, included as stakeholders because they're really important when it comes to children. And uh, they should be included in uh, exercises when uh, you bring in pediatric victims. There should be child life uh, specialists 
uh, helping take care of those children. Uh, they may have special roles in, uh, in, in mass casualty where you have a lot of children come into the emergency department uh, unaccompanied, uh, unaccompanied and uh, they'll need people who specialize in this kind of stuff to start working with them. And it also starts uh, addressing uh, the very traumatic event that the child went through and reduce long-term uh, long consequences for these children. So I, I feel it's... Uh, there, there is, it's not just I feel, there's good evidence that incorporating child life into these type of uh, planning is key and uh, beneficial for the children. So it's half Okay, do um, any, other, any other hands up? I don't think I'm seeing any right now. So last call for any more questions. Jenny, is yours still up from your last question or did you have another one? Uh, I, I think it's still up. I don't know how to put it down. <laughs> oh, no problem. Wait, I got it. <laughs> All right, I don't think I see any more. So again, I would like to say thank you so much for presenting, um, presenting with us tonight. That was, that was a very great presentation and I know that our students got a lot out of it. And, um, Everybody else, I'm going to be posting the, um, the recording link from this presentation, so you'll be able to use it as a resource. And I'll also, you know, um, ever, also the students who were not able to attend live will be able to see it. And again, just a reminder that um, our next